Hey everybody, welcome back to this series where I go through various RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one I'm going to be doing three gauntlets for the Shadow Dark RPG. Gauntlets are level zero adventures, they're funnels from DCC basically, where you take a bunch of peasants or level zero characters and you throw them into the meat grinder and you see how many survive and how many make it out the other side and those that make it out the other side, you can level them up to level one. So it's a very different kind of adventure that you're going to be running, obviously. If you're not used to running gauntlets or funnels, then uh, it's not it's not what you're usually used to. You're going to be seeing characters die left and right, and usually there are much higher lethality rates. I mean, obviously, because you have so many more characters. Usually you're controlling two to four characters per player. So um, you're looking at a lot of death, basically. <laughs> and so the kinds of, again, the kinds of design you're doing with these dungeons is different than a level one uh, adventure, usually. So the first of these I want to cover is the Crypt of the Mad Alchemist. Now this one and the second one I'm going to look at, the Trial of the Slime Lord, are both free. The third one, the Cry of the Sting Bat, is like $2.50 or something. It's real cheap. Um, all three of them are really interesting. They have different things that they do really well that I like. I don't know if I like everything about all three of them. In fact, I know that there are things that I don't like about them. But all three of them are great gauntlets. And I think I would run all three of them, depending on the group that I had, depending on the circumstances of the, the situation. If I was starting a campaign, I might use one over the others if I was... Well, I'll talk about that more as I go through it. Now, the first of these, as I said, is the Crypt of the Mad Alchemist. It's the most, I would say, incomplete and amateurish of the three. It Some of the, the writing needs an additional you know, revision. There are some misspellings and you know, there's a lot of bad grammar here, and it just needs another revision. Um, like, for example, the, the last optional rule on this page says nobody gets special C in the dark vision. Like, I know what they're saying, but it sounds like a very bad translation or something into English. And, uh, and there's stuff like that throughout. So you kind of have to put up with that if you're going to read through this. There's also places where there is intentionally, um, well, like, things have been left intentionally blank in terms of, like, art. And, and um, the author mentions that that's by design, that this is a blank space. Hopefully art will be added rather than using AI art. He's leaving it open for someone else to come by and basically offer to draw or to, to do art for his, his one shot here or his, his, his gauntlet here. Um, I, I don't know about that. I mean, I, it's a free document, so don't get me wrong. I mean, whatever he's offering is worth it, right? Because it's, it's product for free. <laughs> so that, that's great. Um, but I, I feel like that's a mistake. I think probably the better thing to have done would be to either put in AI art or just put in maps on those pages because there's no maps until the very end. And that's a problem. I, I really don't like that. One of these adventures, the third of this Cry of the Sting Bat, has an incredible map system that I really like. And I think is that element of it is by far the most uh, the most excellent <laughs> of all of these three, the way that the, the third adventure does the, the maps. These first two... They're good maps when you actually look at them, but you don't get them until the very end, and so you have to flip back and forth. I think, given that he didn't have art, it would have been better to put those maps on those pages. But you know, leaving that aside, it's still it's still fine. And and the, the fact that there isn't AI art in it, that's okay. That's that's totally okay. Um, gives us a breakdown of what the background is. Essentially, you're a bunch of villagers from this uh, ba you know backwater nowhere where. Uh, your village has been suddenly swarmed by slimes and there's all these gross slimes everywhere and ruining everything and, and people are leaving and some people have already left to try to solve it and they haven't come back and so you are going to go and try to deal with this and save your home. I like it. It's a very solid level zero adventure um, hook. It's a very good funnel. You're a bunch of villagers and you're going to go try to save your own village. You're not going to rely on heroes or adventurers to do so. You're going to be the heroes. So I really like that. Um, one thing is if you were going to try to make this an actual campaign, move this from level 0 to level 1, you'd kind of have to explain how these villagers go out, save their home, those that survive do, and then decide to leave their homes and go off an adventure. In fact, this says, you know, you, you, you kiss your family goodbye and you go to try to save the village. Um, there, if you have, a, like, you know, it's kind of doing both. <laughs> your children, your animals, your meager possessions, you're, you're still a village. Like, why would you become an adventurer after saving your village? So that's a little bit of a confusing thing, but it wouldn't be that hard to change or modify a little bit. Um, it has a rundown of what 
level zero characters are like, and then you get the play suggestion along with start. It says you should run four characters at a time, and they should kind of be grouped together and do the same thing at the same time. Each of these has a different take on how to do gr running your, your group of level zero characters. This one just says run them as a mob, kind of. Um, this is where you see that art placeholder, right? And a description of what the art should be and then how to you know, reach out to this guy if you want to actually make it uh, more, um, if you want to add some art to it. Um, now, essentially, you have this crypt that goes down into the earth and it uh, opens up into sort of like an, an alchemist's laboratory. And so there's also some, some cave systems that you go through. It's a fairly big dungeon and it's actually really cool. One of the problems with having the maps at the end is that you kind of have to click through the whole adventure to see it. Now, I like how he does the formatting. It's interesting. You get blue for the NPC, you get purple for the room numbers, you get, and, and for tables, basically reference, references to other things, you get red for monsters or for, for hazards, and then you get these sort of yellow and charcoal, you know, skill checks, essentially, in the background, ability checks. Um, this is where you see some of the, the errors in the room numbers. Um, reference to the, the, the particular rooms are different. Uh, the armory, for example, is not 1.2, it's 1.1, and it says that right here. So, like, you see it says armory 1.2, but then 1.1 is the armory. Now, it confused me for just a few seconds when I was reading through it, so I think it's probably not that confusing. But just it's another thing, you know, it needs another draft just to fix it up. Um, one of the things that I really like about this adventure is that there are lots of ways to go from floor to floor. You'll see that when we get to the map, but you could, there's the central well that connects the entire adventure, and if you have enough rope, you can just go to any floor. There's four levels of the dungeon. There's the ground floor, and then there's level one, two, and three below. And you can use the well to get to any of them. That's really cool. And then there are other paths down, chasms, you know, stairwells and, and things like that, hatches with, with uh, ladders and things that take you down. So there's lots of different ways to go through it. There's a couple optional tr puzzles and kind of side things to figure out as well. Rooms that you can try to do, they're dangerous, obviously, but they're, they're very clearly optional if you want to try to do them. That's cool, too. It does seem pretty deadly, but there are also two different opportunities in here to find basically backup characters, villagers who had gone ahead of you and who had been captured. Um, there's also one really creepy monster in here, the Lair of the Listener. The Listener himself, a really creepy, cool idea. Um, and... Uh, don't know exactly where it comes from, probably some alchemical creation, but it's really creepy. Um, and it's a good mid-tier boss as you're going down. Um, as you can see, it's really like basic in its presentation. There's bolding and then there's that color variation, but it's a lot of text to just kind of like read on the page. I really recommend if you, well, you're going to have the PDF, this isn't in print. So if you're going to have the PDF, extract the map pages and have them separate. Or if you're going to print this off and run it in person, have a separate file open where you can look at the maps while you're looking at this. Really, it's important to do that. Um, but you get fungal caverns, you have submerged tunnels with piranha swarms. And I have nitpicks about individual things here and there, but overall, this is a totally great adventure. And again, the fact that it's free means that this is just infinite value. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's really... It's really quibbling if you talk about any of these little details that I might change as I run it. And I probably would change some things when I run it, but it's a great uh, a great little adventure to run through. There's the final alchemist who's running around throwing stuff at you, throwing potions and, and bottles full of stuff at you. And, and uh, then you get, the, you get a bestiary at the very end with some uh, set um, things from the Shadow Dark book, but also some new creatures. And then you get the maps. This is the ground floor. Um, you have a little bit of an... Uh, uh, prayer room above it and then you get the floors going down with this big well shaft in the middle and there's uh, you know different ways to go and proceed it looks fairly linear or it did when i first kind of glanced through it but then i realized oh that's a way down oh that's a way down and that leads you to this portion and that leads you to that portion and actually when you study it you realize there's a lot of different ways to go down into the earth and it's a four level dungeon it's a four level gauntlet which is pretty big it's it's got quite a few rooms um and then at the very end you have random tables for names your starting gear for random weapons and armor, and then random encounter tables, and then finally you get valuable tables, cursed item tables, magical item tables, alchemical weapons tables, fungi, and then the legal stuff at the end. The, so one of the things that this adventure does is it spends a lot of time with random stuff, random tables. A lot of the treasures will be like, you know, just say roll twice on the random treasure table here. Um, that's cool. That's fine. Actually, all three of these adventures do that. And I think that's an interesting way of proceeding. You, you as the DM, don't know necessarily what reward is waiting the players if they do this. 
neither do they. Um, now, one thing you might want to do with that, obviously, is... I mean, I, I what I try to do at my tables, for example, is I try to make sure that the reward is worth the effort, right? So if you roll randomly for rewards and they say they have a very bad random encounter or something and it goes really badly and they barely make it through but they sacrifice a lot and they finally get through it and then they roll for rewards and it's like a torch and two pythons or something like that I'm like okay that's kind of disappointing so you know just in your back pocket i'd recommend when you do these random table adventures where the rewards are all randomized be willing to boost them a little bit if the players have a particularly rough time getting to that counter that that treasure Anyway, Crypt of the Mad Alchemist, really great uh, gauntlet by Stuart Forsythe. I'll put the link below to where you can get it. Totally solid, and again, the fact that it's free means that it's of infinite value, so just go grab it. <laughs> um, the next adventure here is Trial of the Slime Lord. It's another one of these ooze-themed adventures. Um, this is also a level zero gauntlet for three to five players. So it has a similar... Uh, it's a similar product in that it's uh, a gauntlet for Shadow Dark about slimes and oozes. But that's pretty much where the similarity ends. Um, oh, actually, another way they're similar is that the map is only at the end. <laughs> but this is an interesting idea. The idea here is that you have been kidnapped um, and you have been thrown down into a pit to face the trial of the Slime Lord. Essentially, there's this cult that is testing people to see if they can survive the slimes. And if they can do it, then they get this blessing. And if they don't, they're food for the slimes down in their pit. Now, it says you're kidnapped from your village, but a lot of this adventure actually kind of makes me think of like an urban adventure. Like there are pipes and there is like a great system and a water system, a sewer system. So I actually think this would be a better like urban adventure. You're in a city, you're kidnapped out of your inn, and you're thrown into this like thing beneath the city by this creepy cult that serves this ooze. And you're trying to make your way out. I think it would be better as an urban uh, one shot or, or gauntlet than as sort of a village out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but anyway, there's a bit of advice about how to run this adventure and what the goal is. You're trying to escape and you have to gather these clues, essentially, in order to be able to open up the door. There's a few optional things. So there's one optional thing, kind of, that you can find, a very powerful magic item that will help you in the final boss, sort of. And there are random encounters you're rolling pretty frequently. And there's a, basically, you're going to be running into, eventually, you're going to be running into Raka Uku which is a giant gelatinous cube. It's called a necrotic cube or something. Yeah, necrotic cube. And it's an, a giant cube, cube of ooze that's eating things. Um, now, you're only he's only really going to eat one character every time you encounter him, and then he will leave unless they attack him. But until the very end, then he comes and tries to eat everybody right at the very end. Um, it's it's, it's kind of scripted, but it's actually not scripted. It's actually clever in the way that it does it. Um, so you have some random encounters and then things that happen when they lick a puddle in a slime dungeon. So there's this <laughs> green, blue, white, or yellow. If you happen to eat some ooze or taste it, you can actually have some slightly random effects, which is kind of cool. Um, one of the clues you can find in the dungeon is sort of a scrap of paper that says some can be eaten for... So there's an inclination the players might want to try eating some of the oozes that they find. Um... They're thrown down into the pit and they get a single torch. And that's when you're supposed to remember this is Shadow Dark, so the torch timer is, is, is expected to be used. And that's the idea is you have a torch timer and it starts right at the beginning and you have an hour to try to get out or to try to find the other torches. Because there are some other torches hidden throughout the dungeon to restart the torch timer. So it's a little bit of like a, you know, a, there's a ticking clock that you try, you're trying to get the, the next torch and refill the meter, basically. It's kind of cool. Um... There's a mad halfling down here. I don't know what he's living on, except maybe eating oozes, but I don't know exactly how he's getting them. But that's okay. Now, there is one way out of this dungeon other than the kind of intended way. And it seems a little bit easy to do. So I might not have it be there, or I might make it harder or something. Um... So I'm not sure about that other way out, but I, I do like the kind of the main way you're going around. There's some riddles to solve about, you know, how to, you have to offer some flesh and bone to these things in order to find the, 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 the basically the poem or the, the incantation to get out. There are some set treasures that you can find, but then there's also random gear that you can find in the appendix at the back of the book or the PDF, I should say. Um, there's essentially two wings to the dungeon, which you'll see one of them leads to one half of the clue, the other half, or one half of the incantation, the other wing leads to the other half of the incantation. And there are some 
optional things to find in each. But for the most part, it's pretty straightforward. There's some really cool ideas, like there is one um, one chamber where you have to eat the ooze, uh, that's sort of this orange slime that makes you hallucinate. And if you eat it, then you see the, the, the incantation forms on the wall. Previously, the, the runes had been indecipherable. And then you have some random stuff that can happen if you eat that uh, ooze. And so it's kind of an interesting encounter there. There's some jelly skeletons you have to fight. Uh, there's an armory with some rusted old weapons. There's a slime-proof holy symbol and some mucus you can choose to put on yourself. And then there's the door itself. And when you open the door, when you finally get the, uh, the incantation and you speak it aloud, it takes three rounds for the door to fully open and to the point where you can scuttle underneath it and get out. And as soon as you say it, the ooze, the big gelatinous cube appears and starts to attack. So he's sort of like the final boss. You have to survive as long as you can against him and try to get out before he eats you. You can try to kill him too, straight up. Especially if you have the optional hammer, which is sort of the secret magic item to find if you manage to put together the rest of it. You get that. And then there is a way out, the passage, with some wolves. And then there is the aftermath. And if you escape, then you have the the uh, the cult blesses you, essentially, and lets you go. They give you the boon of the Slime Lord. There is actually a third way I forgot that you can get out, and that's this little grate, but only halflings or goblins can make it through, and they have to make a very high con check. But if they succeed, they just get out. I don't really like that. I would probably make it something like there's a really powerful item or there's a great reward at the end of the pipe that they can then bring back to their party rather than just have, oh yeah, they're out, they're done. You lose those characters, but they've made it out. I probably wouldn't do that. Here's the map of the place. You start in this sort of circular room over here and you, uh, this is the uh, one wing and, and the southern, or the, the bottom of the page is one wing and then the, the top part of the page is the other wing. And, Room 15 is this part down here, and that's where everything kind of happens at the end. You have an appendix of random gear, uh, random villagers, because one of the random encounters is a random villager who's been thrown down here. Um, then there's magic items, the boon of the slime lord, which is the blessing if you survive. There's Marasoda, the sledge slayer, which is the big hammer. It's indestructible, which is pretty crazy. Um, then there's slime proof holy symbol of Madeira, which helps you basically, you can turn slimes. Um, and then there's the trusty helm, which is just a helmet that protects you against critical hits, which is kind of cool. Then there's some handouts if you want to print them out. These are the notes. You can find scraps of notes in the dungeon. It gives you clues about things going on. And then there's the basic information here. This is by Jordan Rudd. This adventure is by Jordan Rudd. Um, so another great funnel, um, another great level zero adventure. Now this one's only for two to three characters per player, so there's fewer people. And there aren't that many set encounters that are combat encounters in the dungeon. You're relying more on the random encounter table to make your fights interesting, to make them happen. And you're you're always counting down to get to the, um, the... The way that the random encounters work is that you're more and more likely to encounter the giant gelatinous cube. And so he's basically going to be picking people off as the adventure goes along. And I think that's kind of cool. It's an interesting built-in timer. Now, there isn't any way to bring people back. I mean, you could, you could, one of the random encounters could be you You run into a random villager, and that's, you know, if, you, if one of the players has lost all of their characters, then it could be something they can control. So there's ways to, to let players keep playing if they lose their characters. Um, but I could see this all going very badly, especially if you get to the very end with maybe two or three characters left, and the ooze just eats them all right at the very end. <laughs> it would be a very anticlimactic ending. Although, I've played funnels in DCC where everybody died. So I have played level zero of gauntlets where there were no characters left by the end. So this is another, again, another great adventure, um, similar in theme. What I like about this one is the, I like that idea of making this an urban adventure, like you're underneath the streets of the city um, and, you know, you're, you've been captured by a cult. You could make that like, you know, you're brand new adventurers who enter the city and that night you're taken by this cult. So it would be, this would be a place, a way to start a campaign. I could really see this being a cool start to a campaign, like an urban campaign. And maybe the, the slime cult becomes like a, a continuing, you know, villain as you go forward. The adventure itself is well designed. It's interesting. You kind of have to go everywhere. There are optional things to do, but you do have to go through all the major rooms of the dungeon. Um, but it isn't really linear. It's not very like room and then room and then room and you have to do it in that order. Uh, so you can choose the, your path forward. So that's cool. I like this one a lot. And again, it's free. So I'll put the link below to where you can get it. You should certainly get it. This is probably the one I would be more inclined to run over the for, over than the first one. But they're both cool. Now the third of these is the Cry of or Cry of the Sting Bat, which is a Shadow Dark Gauntlet by Runehammer Games, 
uh, hankering for a nail. Um, it's again, I've I've, I've done other um, Rune Hammer game products before. I did ICRPG. I reviewed that, and I reviewed the Crow's Cage. And if you have checked out those videos, or if you know those products, you'll you'll get an already kind of know what this one's like. It has that more narrative, linear approach. But I think this one it it does it really really well because the uh, it doesn't feel artificial in its linearity. It makes sense given the context of the adventure. So I'll talk about that and what's going on. And it also opens up right at the very end, sort of optionally. But it does open up right at the very end. Okay, so what we have is um, pretty standard presentation by Runehammer Games, uh, art by Brandish Gilhelm, and uh, it's for Shadow Dark directly. It came out this past year, 2023. Um, you have the table of contents here. Very, very short adventure. This is only a 10-page PDF or 11-page PDF. You have an introduction, and the idea here is that the trog men, the troglodytes, um, have been uh, throwing villagers down into these caves where these sting bats live, the, uh, the you know, bats that, that drain the blood of the living, basically giant insects, mosquito bats sort of thing, gross, gross creatures. Um, and they have been kind of riling them up and getting them used to, to to people so that they can go out and feed on the people as well. Basically, they're they're trying to drive out the uh, the new colonizers who are coming in, uh, the local villagers who are settling in their lands. And so the trogs are using this to, to kind of fight back because they can't do it on their own. And so they're, uh, you are basically people who have been grabbed by the trogs and thrown down into the pit. Now, every night these things swarm out, and every dawn they come back. And so you have until dawn, essentially, to survive. Because once they come back, they're just going to devour everything in the caves. So every, character, every player is supposed to get two characters, and you're supposed to try to make it out in a certain amount of time. Now, this one, once again, it uses that, that live element, that, that real-time element of Shadow Dark. But instead of using the torch timer, it just says, okay, you have four hours. You have four hours, um, you know, with table breaks and when the pizza delivery guy delivers pizza basically <laughs> you have four hours leaving that aside to get out um so you have our fe a fiendish feast as a background and then our victims heroes and what's going on and how who they are the introduction is time is running out every 30 minutes you roll a new encounter even if you're in an encounter so you keep that timer going um, and then it says he says at 30 minutes left you should play a sound effect of the, the sting bat's cry and it should play it louder and louder and louder and last every five minutes until finally you get devoured, basically, if you're still there. Um, so you don't need to worry about torches, but you should still use a real timer. Any characters still inside are killed instantly. And then you get the dungeon itself. This is the basic level of it, the Grimwell Depths. You get a description of what they're like and then a sort of flavor text. And then everything else is just written on the map. This is what I meant earlier when I said that this does a really good job of just presenting the information all visible to you all at once. This is the whole description of the floor. The map itself, along with what needs to be done, drawn right next to the room, and treasure drawn right on there too. Wherever the treasure chests are, that's a cache of starter equipment with D4 items. That's it. And you have a brief description of the challenges that are required to get through the room, and how far generally things are if you're moving in turn order, how far you can go and, and how you should proceed. And that's it. That's the whole floor. So you get a ton of information. You get three rooms plus a challenge, the, the rock fall ascent, in this little space here. Really efficient use of space in this document. I like that a lot. Once you've moved past the, the, the Grimwell depths, you get into the Grimwell caves. And these are more worked old trog men hewn caves. Um, you get some choices here. You can go left or right. You can, instead of just going straight linearly, you can go and kind of find some extra treasure, but it's a little bit of wasted time. And every minute counts because you're in real time. Now, one of the things that I, I wonder about with this real time element is you as a DM, you're going to be constantly conscious of how long you're taking to describe things. And players might, if especially if they end up all dying, they might be a little resentful if you took a lot of time to describe something or you got mixed up or you messed up or anything like that. Like, you know, you got to be willing to roll with things like that and to correct yourself or maybe to add more time onto the clock if, if you have made a big mistake. I don't know. Whatever it might be, it's, um, you know, that, that it pre presents different challenges to have a real-time game going like that. Um, now, one of the things that you find on this, this floor is the 
there is an optional sort of end quest that's hinted at rather than laid out. And one of the things you can find in here is uh, the sect of the Proboscis, a cult that worships these things. There is information about them down here. So that's one way, if you happen to find that, then there's a sort of an alternate, not alternate ending, but an additional thing you could do past the end of the timed adventure. But again, this is the whole description of the floor. Ochre jellies, uh, there's a jam doors, a long dead prisoner, there's a giant frog in the mud lake, and there's some treasure on the various alternate ways to go. And finally, you get the Grimwell Grottoes, which is this basically long shaft up, and you have to try to climb it. It's very difficult to do so. Um, now, there's a, there's a reference here to DC-16 climb skill, and if you fail it, you, you have to be assisted. So basically, it says those without climb skill must be assisted. I assume that means those who fail must be assisted, uh, because, of course, Shadow Dark doesn't use skills. Now, this could be a reference to other games, or it could be it could be just saying more generally, but I think what it's intending to say is those, without, those who fail the climb skill must be assisted if they're going to get out. Otherwise, they just can't get out. Um, and he has some notes here about how to run this and uh, what can happen to you if you are get really close to the exit. But unfortunately, if you're if you're even you know two squares away from the exit and the timer runs out, you're devoured. But if you're outside, you're not devoured, no matter how, no matter the fate of the rest of your allies behind you. So it gets kind of a bit of a run there at the end. Now there is a rat enclave about halfway up, and that has an alternate thing that can happen there. Uh, the secret of Bim. Bim is this little rat girl who has a plan to kill all of the sting bats. So if you happen to stop at that place and you talk to her, she says, here, here's a way to kill them, but it's very dangerous. Um, and uh, you have to spray this stuff directly on them. Three different people have to do it. It's a dex DC 15 to execute it at point blank range. What I might say is it's a DC dex DC 15 to execute it um, without dying. I might say that if you fail it by 10 or more, you don't do it at all. But if you fail it at all, you die, it, but you still succeed. That way you can kind of have a, like a heroic last minute death for some of your characters at least. Um, then you have the Trogmen who are outside somewhere in the forest. If you want revenge, he says, if, for, for this whole thing, you can go and try to fight them. And some stats for them and how they might work and how they some tactics. And then finally, you have the sect of the Probuscus, which is a Probuscids, which is the cult that's been breeding these things in the first place. And so maybe you have to, once you've dealt with the Trogs and once you've escaped, if you had indication that these guys are out there, maybe you need to go deal with them too. Now, these would obviously be beyond the scope of the Gauntlet itself, probably, but you could still run them as part of the Gauntlet if you wanted to, if a lot of the characters had survived or something. But I would imagine this is more like a follow-up once you've leveled up to level one. And then finally, you get some resources. Um, along with a uh, Spotify playlist for this particular adventure. And then uh, a note from Runehammer uh, at the very end there with thanks to Kelsey and the Shadow Dorks. <laughs> so that's a th the third of these gauntlets. I really like it. I think it's cool. I don't know if, I mean, it's pretty linear, especially early on, but as I said, it makes sense given the conceit of the adventure. You've been dropped down a shaft and there's only one way out. you got to climb out. It's very a narrative, but you're, it's more like how quickly can we find, how quickly can we succeed on all these tests and um, can we make it to that exit um, with the timer. Now, I've not run any of these, so I can't tell you how, for this one in particular, I can't tell you how tight the timer gets or anything like that. I could imagine it getting pretty tight if you got unlucky if you ran into a random encounter that took a long time to deal with and then another random encounter got piled up on top of it and you had to retreat and reorganize like i could see this getting pretty messy but um on the other hand it could also if you got lucky you could just run right through it and then you know you you'd be done in a couple hours or something like that i could see that happening too so i imagine it's been play tested and i imagine it's it's the the four hour timer is pretty close but if you found that you were going too fast you could always shorten it or if it was a little too slow maybe you could have two sessions of two and a half hours or two sessions of three hours or something and extend it a little bit you could easily modify this to your tastes so these are the three gauntlets that i wanted to cover trial of the slime lord uh crypt of the mad alchemist and cry of the stink bat i link all three are great they're, they're great in different ways I probably would play, I'd be more inclined to play the Cry of the Sting Bat and the Trial of the Slime Lord over the Crypt of the Mad Alchemist. But that's probably because this one is just more standard. It's more of like a dungeon crawl. It's an, it's a, it's an effective dungeon crawl. And the other two do something kind of new. 
Trial of the Slime Lord, you're kidnapped and trapped, and you have to try to find this way out. And, I, and again, I think maybe my idea of doing it as an urban adventure just appeals to me for some reason, so I like that idea, which is not really the adventure itself, to be fair. It's kind of built on top of it, but it, but that just connected me to this one in a way, and I liked it for that reason, I guess. Uh, and I think it's a good, it's a competent adventure, too. It's interesting, and, and it seems like it'd be quite fun. And then the Cry of the Sting Bat, again, linear and narrative, but really good in those ways, and I think the design of it's really excellent. The presentation of the maps and how easy it is to read and run, um, along with the additional materials after, if you do make it out, would present uh, a short campaign, a few adventures, a few sessions at least. I think that's cool. So anyway, I'll, again, I'll put links below to where you can get all these. I hope this has been interesting to you guys, and I'll see you all in another video.